Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Mayor Terry Tornick's 2019 State of the City event for the beautiful city of Pasadena. I am Tyrone Hampton, council member for the first district. I wasn't expecting that. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening and to serve as your MC. Before I begin, I'd like to give a big round of applause to everyone from Pasadena High School, home of the Bulldogs. Come on now, y'all can do better than that. It's the Bulldogs. It is great being here in this newly remodeled gymnasium tonight. Thank you everyone who had something to do with this remodel of this beautiful um, facility. In the tradition of my alma mater, go Mustangs. Here we go. I knew I was in a, I knew I was in a good place. PHS also excels in both academics and athletics. I hope you've had the opportunity to visit some of the booths over here to the, to the left of me. And if not, before you leave tonight, I hope you get a chance to go over and check them out. Um, tonight we have with us um, Collaborate Pasadena. Collaborate Pasadena, please wave your hand. We have also over there serving um, on the booth, Los Angeles County Registrar's Office. Get out and vote. Make a difference. Pasadena Water and Power. They're going to tell you how to save 10% on your water bill this week only. Turn your sprinklers off. Housing, we have the housing department. We have library with us. Teaching all of our young people how to read. Human services and recreation. We in the right place, we in the gym too. We have fire and our police department with us, public, serv public, public safety officers. We have public works, nothing gets done without public works, the roads, you name it. We have our public health department as well with us tonight. Thank you for keeping us healthy, love it. It is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight two students that will help kick off this beautiful event. They will start off with the Pledge of Allegiance and also introduce us to some of our PUSD family. These students will also share with us a little, about, a little bit about the life of being a student at PHS. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium student body president, Devon Johnson, and student body treasurer, Candace Chu. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Pasadena High School, home of the Bulldogs. <laughs> Woo! My name is Divine Faith Johnson, and I have the amazing opportunity to serve as Associate Student Body President here at PHS. It is with great honor and Bulldog pride that we welcome you tonight here at our newly renovated Tom Hamilton Gymnasium. We here at PHS could not think of a better way to share our beautiful renovations and are pleased to host our Pasadena Mayor's State of the City Address this evening. I would now like to introduce our Associated Student Body Treasurer, Candace Hsu, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please take your seat. On behalf of the students, faculty, and personnel of the Pasadena Unified School District and Pasadena High School, it is our pleasure to extend our warm welcome to our mayor, government officials, city staff, neighbors, and greater community. I would like to recognize in the audience this evening our superintendent, Dr. McDonald, <laughs> PUSD board members, Lawrence Torres, <laughs> Patrick Calhan, <laughs> Scott Phelps, <laughs> Kim Kenny, 
Roy Bogosian, <laughs> and Michelle Richardson Bailey. And our PHS principal, Robert Hernandez. I would also like to recognize any trustees from the Pasadena City College Board. Can you please stand? <laughs> Pasadena High School has a deep tradition and has served our community for over 130 years. PHS is an outstanding school that focuses on preparing students to be college and career ready upon graduation. We proudly boast a graduation rate of over 97%, and our students have earned over $18 million in scholarships and grants over the last two years. <laughs> PHS offers three college and career pathway programs. The Creative Arts and Media Design Academy, which houses the two programs, the Graphic Communications Academy and the Visual Arts and Design Academy. Our Law and Public Service Academy houses one of the only teen court programs in the area. Our teen court is part of the Superior Court of California in the County of Los Angeles and gives students the opportunity to hear real court cases and serve as jurors. Our App Academy focuses on computer science and gives students an opportunity to explore careers in technology. What is unique to PHS is our ability to foster to a sense of community. PHS prides itself in inclusivity and has cultivated a group of students that supports one another. We don't believe in bullying and we don't acknowledge socioeconomic differences. No matter who you are, what you believe, or where you come from, we are one bulldog family. <laughs> Growing up in both the private and the public school systems in Pasadena has given me a unique perspective on how, on how I view education. I have personally debunked the myth that a private school education is better, and that stems from all the opportunities Pasadena High School has given me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Aside from student government, PHS has opened the doors for me to be a Pasadena City Council member, which will you guys raise your hands, you guys are back there. <laughs> a UCLA VIP scholar, and a 2019 Young, Young Legislator, which is a program ran by former Pasadena Mayor and PHS alumni Assemblymember Chris Holden. I currently hold the title Miss Pasadena Teen USA, and next week we'll be competing for the title Miss California Teen USA. Thank you. I, like so many other PHS students, am grateful for all the opportunities PHS has given me and the safe and inclusive learning environment that this school offers. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to More Amazing Bulldogs, our very own PHS Learns Orcasis dance team, coached by Courtney Winder, Kimberly Whitley, and Gabby Cervantes.
All right, all right, all right. That was good. Wow, I almost wanted to jump off the stage and run around and get some pictures, you know. It was really good. Good job. Well, let's give another big round of applause to our Miss California, right? Um, Miss Devon, and as well as Candace, and our incredible Learns dance team. Go Bulldogs. We're getting close to the main event, and I hear people chanting, Terry, Terry, Terry. Come on, I hear y'all, I hear y'all. It's all good. Um, this is the mayor's fourth State of the City address. And four times, the mayor will make this address inside of a gymnasium in a public school. The previous three were held at McKinley, Washington, and Marshall. This has all been intentional. Mayor Tornick is passionate supporter of Pasadena Unified School District. Tonight's State of the City represents the continuation of that relationship between the city and PUSD. Both serve the residents of the beautiful city of Pasadena, U. It is important that the city and PUSD continue to work together in our ongoing quest to make Pasadena the most vibrant city and most beautiful place in the world. In the world. I want to personally offer my congratulations to PUSD on another fantastic joint project. Thank you for agreeing to host the State of the City for the fourth time and for all you do for the children and families of our city. Thank you again, Principal Robert Hernandez, my man. PUSD Superintendent Dr. Brian McDonald. Something about the echo in here just sounds good. And thank you to PUSD faculty, staff, and board members. Thank you. This is, this is my first opportunity to serve as your MC for the State of the City event. I'm filling in for the Vice Mayor Kennedy, who couldn't be with us this evening. As you may know, I was recently elected by the council to serve as your next Vice Mayor. I am honored. Thank you. Thank you. I am honored and blessed to be a representative of the city of Pasadena and the residents of the first district. And I look forward to serving the city in this, in this capacity as vice mayor. Before I introduce the mayor, I would like to further acknowledge dignitaries with us this evening. Please stand when I call your name. My fellow Pasadena council members, Margaret McAustin. Please stand, Margaret. Andy Wilson. In the district that we happen to be in right now is served by Jean Masuda. We have representatives from Anthony Portentino's office with us tonight. Please stand. We have rep representatives from Assembly Chris Holden, who is also a bulldog, by the way. Please stand. And we have representatives from Catherine Barger, Supervisor Catherine Barger's office with us tonight. In the back, everybody, in the back. We have board members and staff from the Hollywood Burbank Airport Commission. Please stand. <laughs> Representatives from the city of Burbank and South Pasadena, please stand. <laughs> city of Pasadena district liaisons and department heads, please stand and be acknowledged. And most importantly, we have you tonight. This work would not be done without the people of Pasadena. Also, I can't forget my parents are here. So, my mom and dad, thank you for being here. My mom's first time coming to one of these things. She said, I'm coming. I said, all right, all right. It's also the, the important work of the city of Pasadena accomplishes year after year would not be possible without the dedication and help from community members who serve in voluntary roles 
on our various city commissions and committees and operating boards. Please, if you, if you serve as a commissioner, please stand. <laughs> operating board members, thank you. Thank you for your service to our city. It is now my honor to introduce the person we've all been waiting to hear. The chants are still going. Mayor Terry Tornick has been a part of the fabric of the city of Pasadena for many years. Before becoming the mayor in 2015, he worked as a city employee and served as a city council member. Being the mayor of Pasadena requires a tremendous amount of mental and physical toughness. As mayor, his life is filled with nonstop, and I mean nonstop activities on behalf of the city of Pasadena. I hope you all are as excited as I am to hear about what he has in store for us tonight. Listen with an open mind and an open heart because we all need to work together with a collective goal in mind to continue to accomplish great work for this beautiful city of Pasadena, the greatest city in the world. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the man of the hour, Mayor Terry Tornick. Terry, Terry, Terry. It's okay, everybody can chant now. Pretty tough act to follow. Uh, well, thank you, Tyrone. We look forward to your upcoming service as vice mayor, and I, I know it will be entertaining and, uh, and helpful. Um, welcome, everyone, to this beautiful facility, and again, our thanks to the PUSD for letting us showcase one of its recently completed Prop TT projects. First, I'd like to say that it's a continuing privilege to serve as your mayor, and I appreciate you all coming here tonight. I also appreciate my family's presence, my wife Maria, my son Joshua, and his wife Claudia. And one, one of my six granddaughters, Annabella. The city charter requires that in January of each year, the mayor present a thematic budget message for the stated purpose of receiving and considering public suggestions and comments on the city budget prior to its preparation and ultimate approval by the city council. So for the past three years, I've devoted most of my state of the city speech to our finances. I've provided our residents with a background on how we pay for city services, alerted everyone that the day was approaching when we could not rely on our current sources of revenue to adequately pay our bills, and proposed a 0.75% sales tax increase to the voters, measures I and J, which passed overwhelmingly on November 6th. <laughs> so tonight, I would like to thank the people of Pasadena for selflessly voting to tax themselves by a margin of better than two to one in order to assure our city and its children a better future. Please give yourselves a big round of applause. There are a lot of positive things happening in our city, and the passage of Measures I and J is just one of them. Tonight, we will again begin with our finances, where we've been, where we find ourselves now, and what we can anticipate in the future. As a refresher, particularly for those of you that have been here before, chart A shows that our current 2019 general fund revenues are approximately $245.8 million. The four biggest individual sources, which account for more than half that revenue, remain property tax, $64.9 million, sales tax, $35 million, utility users tax, $27.8 million, and transient occupancy tax, 17.5 million. Everything else, charges, fees, unpredictable intergovernmental transfers, 100.6 million. New development 
and rising property values will continue to be our primary source of revenue and revenue gains, while sales and utility taxes are largely flat, except for the infusion of Measure I dollars, which will begin in July. Chart B shows by department how we spend the revenue we collect. An additional 30 million, which is not shown, is non-departmental like bond debt payments. The big four, as you can see, are police, 77.3 million, up from 71.6 million last year. Fire, 48.1 million, up from 45 million last year. Public works, 21.6 million, the same as last year. And libraries, 11.5 million, up from 11.1 million last year. Everything else, all the other departments, human services, planning, transportation, equal 57.6 million, down from 58.4 million last year. The city's contribution to the, employment, to the employee retirement system, CalPERS, continues to take a growing bite out of our budget. This, there's been a great deal of attention paid to this reality and the actions we have taken to mitigate its impact. There's also been a lot of attention paid to our reserves, which are now greater than pre-recession levels. We have accomplished this by balancing our budgets, eliminating some staff positions, and adding savings generated by one-time payments. Additionally, in June 2017, the City Council allocated $12 million to a special trust account for future pension and other post-employment benefit obligations, and we allocated an additional $500,000 in FY18, thereby further building our reserves. Measure I raises local sales tax by three quarters of a percent and is expected to provide $21 million in revenue annually. 100% of which goes to the city of Pasadena, not to the county or to the state. We'll begin seeing this revenue in fiscal year 20, which begins in July, and Measure I will help move Pasadena forward. Since our forecasted budget is $267 million, it's not a huge piece of the pie, but it definitely helps, as you'll see on chart E, which reviews our future income and expenses. That'll lighten things up a little bit. <clears throat> Thanks to the voters passing Measure I, fiscal year 20 should have an $11 million surplus. And looking further ahead, you'll see that because of Measure I, she doesn't like hearing about taxes, <laughs> the city will continue to be in good shape through fiscal year 24 with income projected to exceed expenses. Incidentally, the dotted line shows where the city's income would have been if Measure I had not passed, a deficit of $2.3 million in fiscal year 20 that would have ballooned to a $13 million shortfall by fiscal year 24. This would have meant imposing draconian cuts in order to maintain a balanced budget and a very different kind of speech tonight. While our forecasting only extends for five years, it appears that despite additional money received from Measure I, our expenses will still increase faster than our revenues. So the obvious question is, will we be confronted with the same deficit problem in 2026 or 2028? Simply put, I really don't know. There are too many uncertainties in the future to project that far out with any degree of certainty. What we can say is that the city budget will always be under pressure from the desire to do more worthy things than we can afford to do. We have forecasted future revenues conservatively, and there are several things that could have a big positive impact on our revenue. For example, additional hotels, significant tax revenues from online sales, and restored federal or state funding. These could bend the revenue curve up in a meaningful way. On the expense side, we've built the reserves to try and protect against unanticipated expenses. But we must continue to be very disciplined in how we manage our spending, or we will be confronted again with a looming threat of operating deficits. 
With all of that in mind, how will we spend Measure I funds? Some might suggest that we spend it on desirable new programs, and there are many worthy causes that we could support. The problem with this strategy is that as expenses continue to grow at a faster rate than revenues, we'd be building in a structural deficit issue for the near future as described earlier. Some would suggest that we put all the money in reserves or pay down some of our pension deficit. This would be the most financially conservative approach, but it ignores some pressing current requirements that really shouldn't be deferred any longer. My proposal is that we use most of the new money to fund urgent capital projects during the years that we have available surpluses. This will not contribute to a structural operating deficit, but will allow us to whittle down our growing list of deferred critical capital projects. For example, a five-year spending plan could address some of the following needs. Citywide facility improvements, $5 million. Fire station improvements and design for new facilities, $120 million. Colorado Street Bridge suicide mitigation construction, $2.5 million. High voltage series light conversion, $20.8 million. City Hall building security management, $1 million. Radio communication equipment upgrade and replacement, $8 million. Sidewalk repair and replacement, $9 million. The total of all this list is $166.3 million. Projected I money that will not be required for operating costs over the next five years totals approximately $29 million. As you can see, the list exceeds that amount by a wide margin. But with careful cash management and perhaps using some borrowing leverage, we can maintain an operating, a balanced operating budget and make a measurable dent in our capital need over the next five years. Not a small achievement. Now a few words about Measure J. This will share one third of the revenue raised from Measure I with the Pasadena Unified School District to protect and strengthen our public schools. The PUSD faces its own significant budget challenges, and if they are to continue in their efforts to improve educational outcomes for our children, they need our support. So the City Council has entered into a serious and unprecedented dialogue with the PUSD board to see how we can use this $7 million per year to make a significant difference. This is a long-term process that will evolve over time and is a way to engage residents who are not PUSD parents in the well-being of our children. Education matters to our entire community, and we cannot have a great city without a great public school system. Now, having nearly exhausted you with the required financial portion of my message, please bear with me for a few minutes of easier to absorb current events and aspirational items. The first one is the 710 freeway. No applause for that. <laughs> now that both Metro and Caltrans have abandoned the proposal to build a connection between the 710 and the 210 freeways, we can finally move ahead with a series of projects that will enhance transportation throughout the region. Metro has allocated $105 million to build a grade separation of the Gold Line and California Boulevard. This is a big, complicated project because of the need to keep the trains running while the construction is underway. It will require much public discussion careful planning and sensitive design. But I believe that the improvements in circulation and improved access to Huntington Memorial Hospital will make the expense and short-term disruption worthwhile. Beyond immediate improvements, we can also begin to address in earnest the future of the terrible ditch inflicted on our city in anticipation of the freeway project. 
This is a legacy land use planning effort with all kinds of legal design and planning issues, but it will result in recapturing approximately 50 acres in the heart of our city for productive uses. To get a head start on that will take, I'm sorry, to get a head start on what will take decades to complete, the city manager has assembled a staff task force to begin to define the issues. I'm really excited about this effort and look forward to a broad public discussion once we've better defined the opportunity. The Arroyo Seco. More than a year ago, I announced a new effort to focus attention on our city's most valuable open space, the Arroyo Seco. A volunteer committee worked long and hard to examine the most pressing issues confronting this wonderful resource and to develop ideas on how we might improve it. This, like the discussion of the recapture of the 710 right-of-way, is a long-term legacy project. However, I'm proud to announce that the Arroyo Advisory Group's effort has resulted in the formation of a new nonprofit group called the One Arroyo Foundation. They have formed a board of directors, begun to raise funds to implement the recommended demonstration trails project. I'm particularly grateful to my friends Bill Bogard, who was here, Somewhere, thank you. And Doug Cranwinkle for leading this effort. And I look forward, and I look forward with great anticipation to further progress this year and in the years to come. To support this effort, the County of Los Angeles has agreed to provide $2.5 million to the Army Corps of Engineers so that they can restart their large-scale habitat restoration study for the Arroyo, which will have profound long-term benefits. And more immediately, Supervisor Barger has just committed half a million dollars in Prop A park funding to the Demonstration Trails Project. <clears throat> we are grateful to the county for all of its support to this priceless resource, and I would like to acknowledge it with a round of applause and recognize Supervisor Barger's representative. There are some other important issues to reference before closing. Homelessness. This is the most pressing problem facing our city. Some positive news includes the initial allocation of county Measure H funding the passage of a motel conversion ordinance, and progress on the Heritage Square site, Heritage Square South site. I've also proposed that we commit city -owned, the city-owned YWCA building to permanent supportive housing. <laughs> police. The city manager has selected a new police chief, John Perez. And there is a renewed commitment to community policing and progressive policies to ensure that all of our residents can rely on equitable treatment. Cannabis. This is an unavoidable subject. The application period is now open for legal sales, cultivation, and testing facilities per the direction of our voters. And we anticipate that some legal operations will be operating this year. The general plan. Public meetings to formulate the detailed specific plans are underway, offering new opportunities for residents to share their vision of what our city will look like over the next 20 years. In related development proposals, there will be new owners and renewed activity for the campuses of Fuller Theological Seminary and William Carey University and the new Kaiser Medical School should begin operation. Also, construction is now underway on the largest development project in the city's history on the Parsons campus in Old Pasadena, a project that just wrote a, a fee check in the amount of $8.6 million. State preemption of local authority. With increasing frequency, the state legislature has chewed away at local authority. 
dates for local elections, granny flats, sidewalk vending, and now threatened preemption of fundamental land use regulations regarding housing. We must stop these intrusions, even if it means litigation. On a happier note, I've been reminded by Councilmember McAustin and Tournament President Farber that 2019 marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Which amendment is that, dancers? <laughs> which finally guaranteed women the right to vote. This year, we will highlight the role that women play in our city and redouble our efforts to make certain that they are properly represented in every facet of city government. In sum, the state of our city is good, and equally important, the trend line is positive. While we are truly blessed as a community, there is a growing trend of persons launching fierce and destructive attacks against others who may disagree with their point of view often before knowing all the facts. This is not the way we conduct our affairs in Pasadena. We're better than that. I ask that our community remain actively engaged in our decision making and do so in a positive and civil manner. In turn, the city council and the staff will continue to work hard to maintain the positive trend and to secure an improved quality of life for all of our residents. And I, too, would like to wish you all a happy new year. Thank you. I hope that this evening has been useful to you, and I must thank those who helped put it all together. Special thanks again to PHS, Principal Hernandez, students and faculty, from the office of the mayor and the city council, Jonna Stewart, who's clicking her way into your hearts. Uh, Araceli Mellum and Rhonda Stone. <laughs> Pasadena Media's Chris Miller, Bobby Ferguson, and Danny Hess. <laughs> Finance Director Matt Hawksworth and Public Information Officer Lisa Dedarian. <laughs> From the Department of Human Services, newly appointed director Brenda Harvey-Williams, Lola Osborne, Leonardo Chavez, and of course, Dolores Mendoza. I'd like to also thank our Northwest Program Ambassadors and our City Manager, Steve Mermel. Now I'd like to follow my personal preference of having at least some questions at any meetings that I conduct please try to ask actual questions. <laughs> if, if you're not called, um, please send me an email or a note and I'll respond. So let's, uh, let's get on the underway. We, do we have uh, microphones that are gonna be? Uh, yes, we do. Who's first? Please raise your hand. No questions? There's one. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. That, uh, those were all good changes. So congratulations to you and the City Council. Along the same lines, I want to ask you if you believe in input from the residents of East Pasadena for the items that impact us directly. Yeah, we, uh, I spend a lot of time with residents of East Pasadena um, on items that impact them directly and, and the rest of the city as well. There has been a tradition of uh, suspicion um, that City Hall is somehow disconnected from East Pasadena, and I assure you that nothing could be further from the truth. We, we care very much about what happens in East Pasadena. We try our best to, uh, to take uh, both local residents' opinions and citywide opinions into account. I think we did fumble the ball um, a little bit in terms of the handling of the infamous, we won't use the words, that related to Orange Grove Boulevard. But I think, I think we, can do, uh, we can do a better job in the future, and Gene Masuda will make sure that we do. Thank you for that, because yes, overnight it did seem like the uh, Sierra Madre Villa 
No, now we're getting off the we're getting off the question part. Now okay. I'm getting one last the question. Part. It seems like the state is trying to take away a, a lot of our um, uh, control over our city. What are the uh, intentions of the city so that that doesn't happen? Well, we we are we are actively uh, working with our legislators and letting them know how we feel about this. Um, we're giving testimony. I'm I'm writing letters. We're doing all the things we're supposed to do like any citizen would do in terms of communicating with their legislators uh, about protecting our rights, uh, they're not listening. These are not active listeners. And uh, unhappily, particularly in the area of land use, uh, they seem bound and determined to completely obliterate local land use controls. And the officials from other cities, we have people from Glendale and, and Burbank and South Pasadena here as well, um, people are starting, and the local level is starting to get fed up. And I think where we're headed with this, uh, frankly, apart from banding together and trying to make a bigger impact in Sacramento, I think we're headed for some litigation on some of these issues. I don't like using litigation, but I don't think we're going to have any choice this time. Anybody else? All the way over here. Arcelli. Uh, here you go. Thank you. Uh, in this morning's LA Times, there was an article about uh, preparation for the big one and retrofitting soft story buildings, uh, which Los Angeles is doing. But it talked about other cities throughout the county that either have started or are not doing much. I want to know what is Pasadena's timetable? What's being planned? Uh, for retrofitting some of our buildings? We have uh, the references to the soft story buildings, buildings that are particularly vulnerable in an earthquake. We began the process more than a year ago in terms of uh, commissioning um, uh, an analysis. Uh, uh, we've inventoried all of our buildings. Uh, we have a, a draft ordinance that's in preparation. Um, there have been public discussions and meetings with building owners. I expect that that will be coming to the council By April, if not sooner, so we're we're uh, we're on that. This is a this is a very significant issue, um, and it it will be somewhat contentious because it means that that property owners are going to have to spend money reinforcing um, these buildings to make them safer. Uh, but I think it's an investment that that we need need to make as a community, and so we're on it, and we'll be dealing with it quite soon. Anybody else? Arcelli? In the middle. Oh, okay. I'm a resident of West Pasadena in the Linda Vista area, and I have a very specific question. We have a lovely branch library there. <laughs> You've been there. And we desperately need a new floor. So my question to you, uh, Mr. Mayor, is, is it possible for you to find in your 2019, 2020, a very nice line item in your budget that would fund our uh, new floor for our library. Thank you. I, I don't know. But we, ha we have a lot of, um, we have almost a billion dollars of approved capital projects uh, in, our, in our capital improvement program that are not funded. Um, this little laundry list that I gave you tonight as a possible way of spending some of the Measure I money uh, will, again, make a dent in that. Uh, but we have, we have an old city with aging infrastructure, and we need to do as, as much as we can, and that's an illustrative example. You know, we have more branch libraries in Pasadena than any city our size, uh, and we love them and we cherish them, and people have voted to tax themselves to support them three times. Uh, but so we, we'll get to it as soon as we can, and, and I appreciate the problem. I know the floor you're talking about. Maybe one more. Good evening, Mayor. Hello. Where are you? Right in. Okay. Oh, it's Howie. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor. Uh, does the city have any plans to start a website that will list every commission, uh, every kind of meeting in one place? so that someone can go and see uh, what uh, various commissions are doing and what's happening. 
Uh, I, I think that uh, that information is available now on the city's website, but I'm afraid it's not in the most user-friendly form. And I know that um, our uh, IT department um, is working on improving it. We just made some important improvements to the website. But I do recognize, and it's, it's been an ongoing source of frustration for me, that um, the way we communicate information to the public um, needs work. Um, we have various departmental newsletters. There's no common formatting. Uh, they're all very useful and nice. Um, I don't know what the total is that we spend on all of them collectively. Uh, but in this day of, you know, sort of instant communication, people have an expectation that we're going to be able to really get information to them in a timely fashion. Um, Lisa Dardarian, our, our public information officer, is very much aware of this. We have a new person working with her, Tiffany, that's been hired. Uh, so that we, I'm very conscious of it, Howie. I don't think we're doing an adequate job. Uh, and, and City Hall is focused on it, and, and uh, I can promise you some improvements in the near future. I think that's going to do it for tonight. Um, we, we, still have, um, we still have these tables are, are still uh, manned or personed, um, and they have information that may be of value to you. I appreciate you turning out on an, on an inclement evening, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.